So in today's lecture, we're going to speak about pressure groups, in particular pressure group effectiveness and also some of the methodological issues that there are in determining how effective a pressure group is, because this is, as you are clearly aware by now, a course in research methods. So we're particularly interested in the kind of methodology and met methods aspects of it in particular. Just a kind of few points, just to put it in context at the start. First of all, we need to remember what exactly a pressure group is. I mean, the one kind of traditional definition would be an organisation that seeks to influence public policy um, in some sense, and that usually in terms of public policy, traditionally we'd be thinking of national government, local government, European Union, something like that. So an organisation that is seeking to influence public policy in that way. But arguably in today's world, we need a slightly broader understanding because sometimes pressure groups now are starting to target firms such as Tesco and things like that because often public tasks and public policy are devolved down and not just necessarily undertaken by the state in the conventional sense. So I think we need to be very clear what a pressure group is at the outset. Also, you know, how we're going to classify a pressure group. You know, are we going to talk, for example, of sectional or causal groups or are we going to talk about inside or outside groups and inside or outside the groups and so on. And of course, we've also um, focused on, you know, the kind of strategies that pressure groups will, will use. Are they going to use, you know, <coughs> conventional tactics such as just conventional lobbying and things like that? Or are they going to involve in, you know, direct action, which can involve, you know, getting on the top of buildings dressed as Batman, for example, which Fathers for Justice have done and so on. So the different kind of strategies that pressure groups will use. And I think we also need, of course, to be aware of how things have changed dramatically in recent years with the internet, particularly kind of social media, Facebook, Twitter, things like that, and how that can actually, you know, alter the way that pressure groups behave and the way that they will campaign. And of course, a lot of the literature you'll read, which was written some time ago, was before the kind of internet and things took off. So I think you do need to be aware of modern developments and not just be using a traditional literature on this topic. So they're just kind of a few points just to provide some context at the outset. So why do we have pressure groups and what are their main advantages and disadvantages? I mean, there is a difference, of course, between a pressure group and a political party. A political party will, will seek office and usually have a broader agenda than a pressure group. So why do we need pressure groups in particular and what are their advantages and their disadvantages? Well, I think one important advantage of a pressure group is that they do allow for more you know, continuous um, representation. We only have elections in Britain every four or five years. If, if the fixed-term parliaments go through, it will be every, every five years. And what happens if... Once a government is elected, they do something that the public is not happy with, something that perhaps wasn't even in their manifesto to start with. I mean, we can think of a couple of examples at the moment. Tuition fees, the £9,000 tuition fees, they were not specifically clearly mentioned in any party's manifesto. So if people feel unhappy about £9,000 tuition fees, they didn't have a chance to vote on them, therefore through pressure groups they can campaign against it. Another example would be the controversial health reforms at the moment going through. A criticism of those health reforms that the coalition government is attempting to introduce is that they weren't in any party's manifesto. So there wasn't a chance for the public to vote on them. So again, pressure groups could campaign on something like that. So with elections only being every four to five years, pressure groups give, you a, give people a chance to campaign between those elections, in particular on things perhaps that were not in party manifestos. And also, of course, at elections, voters are only expressing a kind of general preference. It could very well be the case that someone on the whole, you know, supports the Labour Party, they agree with the majority of the things the Labour Party says, so they vote Labour. But it doesn't necessarily mean they agree with everything associated with the Labour Party. It might mean, for example, they, they don't agree with their policies on education. So they might campaign on a pressure group against their policies on education, even though they vote for them as a whole in a general election. So there you know, is, is you know, some reasons why pressure groups in terms of representation are important. Also, they, they educate as well. I mean, pressure groups can have access to specialised information that the civil service does not possess. The government will rely on the civil service to provide them advice, or ministers will rely on the civil service for advice and guidance on policy. But sometimes pressure groups might have more specialised information to help and promote sensible good public policy making. 
So they might, for example, identify flaws in policy design. Therefore, pressure groups can contribute to the policy making process and promote effective decision making. So I think that's another important aspect of why we need pressure groups as a supplement to the civil service in providing specialised <coughs> advice that can promote effective policy making. We also need to think about the quality of participation, however, in pressure groups. Um, participation in pressure groups can often be very limited, both in terms of quantity and quality. I mean, in, in a lot of the literature on what determines effectiveness on pressure groups, there will be things, references to you know, financial resources and so on, references to the amount of members they have. But it's no good a pressure group having loads and loads and loads of members if all the members do, you know, is, is kind of you know, just pay the money to join and then they don't do much else. I mean, financial resources are important, but you need to think about the quality of that membership as well. Are they actually active campaigners in that pressure group? So involvement may very well be just, just financial, what is called checkbook membership. They just pay their money and then that is it. So it might be very, very passive membership. And there's this idea of selective incentives as well. You know, why do people join pressure groups? Do they join it to campaign or do they join it for other reasons? So, for example, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds is the most popular pressure group in, in Britain. But I doubt whether many people join it because they want to kind of really be, go out campaigning for the protection of birds. Maybe they join it for other reasons. So, for example, it could be that they join to get the free bird nest, which you can get if you join that organisation. So maybe people join pressure groups for other reasons, not just campaigning reasons, because they like the selective incentives or the free gifts or the newsletters and all those kinds of things. And certainly recent work by, by Jordan and, and so on suggests that group leaders think these are more important than the literature suggests. So quality of participation is important. Don't just look at the amount of members a pressure group has, Think about, are they, are they actually active members? Are they actually doing something for the organisation rather than just paying the money to join? There are problems with pressure groups as well. They're not necessarily just a good thing. In some ways, they can make government more difficult. If we go back, for example, to the 1970s in Britain, there was an idea that the trade unions were, had too much power, that they were in control, that we had an overloaded state, that you had the trade unions making all these demands to government, you know, for pay increases and so on, and that made governing very, very difficult because government, you know, can't always give in to demands such as that. Trade unions went on strike and caused lots of problems, of course, culminating in the winter of discontent in 1979. So groups may sometimes make government more difficult. And government, I mean, the role of government is to, is to compromise, isn't it? Is to make choices. And government has to aggregate demands. You know, they have to do, do what is for the common good, the national interest. They can't just go along with one or two pressure groups. So pressure groups may simply articulate the raw demands of members. You know, members of one pressure group want, you know, a 10% pay rise. They're thinking of just their particular interests, not necessarily the interests of the whole country, which is what the government should be doing. So, and also, therefore, it doesn't take account of the opportunity costs for government spending or other programmes. So if a pressure group demands more money for health and they succeed in getting more money for health, it might mean the government spending less on education. So a difference between pressure groups, which are promoting their own interest of their members, and government, which has to promote the national interest. So there might be kind of negative connotations of pressure groups in that sense. Quite a big literature on business groups as well. I did my PhD at Warwick on business representation in Britain, looking at organisations such as the CBI, Chambers of Commerce, um, business organisations, trade associations and so on. And there is this argument in the literature of business being a privileged interest and many private interest business groups aims arguably therefore running contrary to the broader public interest. The idea that you know, business has a lot of power in society. It's big business that actually rules. And some people say you know, that is a big problem in a democracy. Um, the organisations, they say, such as the CBI and big business, have so much power. And there is, of course, literature that suggests that you know, there are accounts of failing groups, so therefore all competing interests are balanced and so on. That's the idea of kind of pluralism, where all these different kind of interests balance each other out and no more interest has more power than another. But there is the alternative argument that that's not actually the case and actually big business and so on, the CBI, organisations like that, have a lot more power than perhaps they should 
um, in a democracy. And if you take that, you know, so in a more kind of left-wing direction, you kind of go to a kind of Marxist critique and so on. So are or do we live in a kind of pluralist, plural, pluralist society with um, counter um, valent groups, you know, shared power and so on, or do certain groups have a lot more power than others? So that could be another problem with pressure groups if we feel that business has too much power in society. So two more questions, therefore, and this gets really to what we really need to talk about today in terms of pressure group effectiveness and what the methodological issues involved are. So let's have a think, therefore, about this. What does effectiveness mean? Well, the word implies, of course, some kind of effect. But even if the group's objective is achieved, how do we know it was down to that group? So, for example, if you have a pressure group campaigning for more public spending on schools, just to give one example, and then the government increases spending on schools, how do you know it was down to that pressure group? That pressure group might boast about it and write about, on, write about it on their website and say, we managed to get the government to put more money into education, but it could be down to many reasons why spending increased on schools. It could have been because of the actions of another pressure group. It could have been down to public opinion as a whole. It could be down to the ideology of the government. So don't just assume that because a pressure group campaigns on something and then that thing happens, that one has necessarily caused the other. So always be very, very sceptical of a pressure group's claims. And this is a big kind of methodological issue, how we actually separate out cause and effect. So that's one point. And also, should effectiveness be judged on whether policy objectives are met or can publicity be an end in itself? So in other words, are we assessing effectiveness by their policy objectives being achieved or are we judging effectiveness in the sense they've brought publicity to their cause? Take Fathers for Justice, for example, the controversial pressure group that has met that campaigns for fathers' rights, that has um, got up on you know top of Harriet Harman's roof dressed as Batman and so on. Now, arguably, they might not have had much impact in terms of changing the law, but they might argue they've been effective because they've brought publicity to their cause. And so maybe you want to consider the aims and objectives of a pressure group and see whether they've achieved those aims and objectives. And one of their aims and objectives may, may very well be to bring publicity to their cause. And if they've done that, maybe they've been effective on their own terms. So think very carefully about what we mean by effectiveness. Some of the literature is now starting to talk about group capacity instead. Group capacity rather than effectiveness. Um, Darren Helping, for example. Um, and this emphasises ability to act rather than outcomes. So this is alternative literature. I don't think you need to kind of go into detail on this, but nevertheless it is something that is good to be aware of in this context, that maybe we could talk about group capacity rather than simple effectiveness. Maybe this is a more sophisticated way of trying to understand it. As I've said, cause and effect is pro probably the most key methodological issue that you need to be considering. As I've said, just because a group is campaigning on something and then that thing happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. And linked to that, do pressure groups become more effective because government policy changes in a way that makes them of central importance? Or even are groups responding to agendas of government? Or do groups themselves bring about policy changes which result in new opportunities for influence? And these are important, you know, methodological issues that I think you do need to consider in your essays. And Wing Grant's book, Pressure Groups and British Politics, which is probably one of the key items on the reading list, um, goes into these methodological issues um, such as this in, in a lot more detail, which is very, very useful um, for you to focus on in terms of this topic. The so cause and effect is perhaps, you know, the biggest methodological issue to consider in the context of this topic. And when we're thinking about policy changes, you know, why does government introduce policy? Why does policy change? Well, there might be lots of reasons for that. It could be the salience of the issue to the electorate. In other words, how important is that issue to the electorate? If it's something the electorate feel really, really strongly about, then maybe policy is more likely to change. I mean, for example, maybe the current health reforms are proving quite controversial, and that's making the government pause and think again on them. 
or it might be just because they're a bit worried the Liberal Democrats are a bit upset and they know the votes won't go through Parliament if they don't make modifications. You know, you can make different arguments. So the salience of the issue to the electorate, if it's something the, the electorate feel, feel passionately about, then I think that's, that is an important issue. The political outlook of the government's important as well. You know, different, different political parties have different values, different ideologies. They believe in different things. So the political outlook of the government, whether a government is left-wing or right-wing, Labour or Conservative, that's going to influence the kind of policies that they introduce, regardless of what pressure groups are actually doing. And expert scientific opinion can never be kind of underestimated as well on kind of technical subjects. Um, take something like, you know, human health, animal diseases, something like that. Expert scientific opinion may be very, very influential as well. So that could be an important aspect. The balance of pressure group activity is one of the things we should consider. But the problem is, you're not necessarily going to have just one pressure group campaigning on an issue. You might have several pressure groups campaigning on an issue, some on different sides of the arguments. <coughs> um, and in the context of you know, the global powers um, theme of the Warwick Knowledge Centre, the global international context is obviously important as well. In, you know, in an era of globalisation, some people say that you know, we're very limited as to the kind of policies that we can introduce. So, for example, if a government started to borrow lots of money or have very, very high taxes, that might cause problems for the economy in a globalised context. So policy will be determined also by global international factors as well. So we do need to think about all the reasons why policy comes about, all the reasons why policy changes, and be aware that pressure groups are just one of the things. There are many, many different factors, and that links back to this issue of cause and effect. Just because a pressure group is campaigning on something and something happens does not necessarily mean that one is causing the other. Now, power and influence is another kind of methodological issue that we need to reflect on as well. Obviously, on, in introductions to politics, you've looked in a lot of detail about what we mean by power and so on. Power and influence cannot be quantified easily, difficult to define. They're often what is called essentially contested concepts. Power is arguably a word like equality, liberty, democracy, that people have so many ideas of what it means, you could go around in circles forever. An essentially contested concept. So it can't easily be quantified, it is difficult to define. But maybe this term influence rests on power to persuade. And maybe that is the usual way that pressure groups will influence decisions, through influence, which is power to persuade and government therefore making concessions because of the validity of the argument. But the idea of power and influence is a very, very complex subject, as you're aware of through the, through the modules, you, modules you've taught, you've um, taken this year. So but you do need to reflect on it, I think, briefly in your essays, what we actually mean by power and influence, and what is it that pressure groups use? Is it power or is it influence? I think public opinion is very, very important as well. Um, government and parliament and MPs and political parties are going to be very influenced by public opinion. And in fact, you might argue that public opinion as a whole is going to be far more important than the thoughts of a particular pressure group. I mean, you, you might think that, um, take tuition freeze, for example, maybe the government isn't so concerned about students going on a march against tuition fees because they might think well, you know, the young are less likely to vote anyway and so on, therefore we're not so concerned about it. But if they're concerned about public opinion as a whole, in particular among their swing voters or their key middle-class support, then they might start to become more concerned. So I think we need to think about whether policy comes about or changes because of the actions of a particular pressure group <coughs> or whether it changes because of public opinion as a whole. But of course... Many issues discussed between pressure groups and government are of a technical nature. Pressure groups aren't often campaigning on huge, big issues that people are going to be interested in. They're often going to be campaigning on quite boring, technical, scientific, nitty-gritty kind of things, which the public aren't really aware of and therefore don't really have an opinion on. And it's on those kinds of issues, maybe, the technical or the scientific issues, that pressure groups are more likely to have a real influence. So that is, I think, a helpful way of trying to look at pin public opinion in this context. But a pressure group may try and influence public opinion. You know, you might have a, a pressure group, for example, that believes there should be more money spent on health on healthcare 
and they might campaign in order to try and mobilise mobilise the public on that particular issue. And then through mobilising the public, then the public as a whole will then put pressure on the government. So look at the kind of way cause and effect works. It could start with a pressure group trying to influence public opinion, and then public opinion as a whole then changes the policy. That's perhaps one way of looking at it as well. Groups also might be likely to benefit from a change in public views, which they have not themselves brought about. Public opinion might change for reasons completely separate from the existence of a pressure group. And also, going back to the work on social surveys and opinion polls, there, are, there is a difference between attitude and beliefs. Attitudes are kind of deeply held perceptions, and opinions are more superficial as well. So think very carefully about public opinion, how important public opinion is in terms of influencing um, policy and the role of pressure groups within that. And all the time, of course, focusing it very clearly, these arguments, so the particular pressure groups that you're interested in in your projects. Now, linking it to research methods, after all, this is a course in research methods. How can research methods and data collection techniques um, relate to this topic? Well, um, Perhaps, you know, one way of doing it would be to, to interview people um, in the decision-making process and find out, you know, talk to MPs, talk to ministers and so on to find out the extent to which they have been influenced by pressure groups. So you could speak to decision-makers in a kind of elite, semi-structured interview and you could ask them what has influenced you to change your mind or to introduce a policy and so on. And they would be able to tell you or may be able to tell you how important a particular pressure group or set of pressure groups were in making them come to their decision. So interviewing could be a way of actually trying to find out how important pressure groups are. Of course, you could also interview people from the pressure group as well. So interviewing decision makers, interviewing people in pressure groups to try and find out what actually happens in the decision making process would be one way of doing it. Um, I suppose in an ideal world, we'd be participant observers. We would go in there, we would observe um, ministers at work, we would undertake participant observation to find out what actually goes on behind the scenes and to find out you know, just to what extent ministers are being influenced by pressure groups. But obviously in practice that can be very difficult, it can be very difficult to get access and so on in order to do that. So think also about how research methods such as elite interviews and participant observation can be linked to this particular topic in terms of the methodological issues in determining pressure group effectiveness. The decision-making process is of course very, very secretive, which can make it particularly difficult to find out how effective pressure groups are. Um, some groups have very simple objectives, so it's easy to say wh whether they've been attained or not. Um, other groups, however, will have multiple objectives. And if a group has lots and lots and lots of objectives, if they're trying to achieve lots and lots of things, it starts to become more difficult to assess pressure group effectiveness. It can be difficult to tell which are the most important and so on. So indeed, you know, there are further issues to consider in this sense. Also, groups will have to compromise. They're not going to be able to achieve everything that they want to do. And you might very well have a pressure group that doesn't achieve what it's set out to achieve. It has a bad outcome. They've been campaigning on something for ages and they don't achieve it or they don't achieve it in full or they've had to compromise. But what they might do, the party membership might, leadership might put a gloss on this in order to calm the membership. So the leadership of the pressure group will pretend that they've achieved a great deal just to try and get new members or to calm down their membership and to make, give an impression that they've achieved a lot. Okay, so in that sense, be cautious of what it says on their website. Just because a pressure group has said it's achieved something, don't, you know, assume that it has. You know, look deep, more deeply into it and so on. Don't just assume that what is said on the website in terms of its successes is necessarily true. Okay, uh, of course, it could work the other way around. There could be a favourable outcome, but the group complains loudly to avoid membership suspicions that they have sold out. So compromise is important, and be aware of that when thinking on this topic. There are further problems. A, a government might toughen up a green or white paper so they have something to give away at a later stage. So in other words, when government is deciding to introduce some policy, they might start off with a really hard line that they have no intention of actually putting into place as a, as a strategy, as a tactic. 
so that they can then give something away and give an impression that they've given in to a pressure group when really that's what they intended to do all the way along. It's like if you're bargaining for something, you might start up, start off you know, with a price or something which is higher than you know you're actually going to get in practice, but you use it as a bargaining technique. And the similar census could be used with pressure groups as well. As I've said, it's rare for one group to be active on an issue. You've usually got a number of groups and a number of pos positions. You know, some groups for fox hunting, some against. Um, so uh, in situations like that, it can be even more difficult to actually measure effectiveness if you've got groups on both sides of the argument. So real challenges actually in determining pressure group effectiveness. And we're not necessarily expecting you to solve all these problems at your level. But nevertheless, we need you to have an awareness of them and what the kind of issues are involved and why it's difficult to assess the effectiveness of a pressure group. We live very much in a changing world as well. I've already spoken about the internet changing the way that pressure groups work, but also state power is now more fragmented, multi-level governance, for example, with devolved power to Scotland and Wales and so on, new forms of politics. As I said at the outset, the target may no longer be the state. Traditionally, pressure groups will have concentrated on um, the states, local government, national government, European Union, and so on, because that's where policy can, comes from. But now, groups such as you know, supermarkets and so on might have a lot of power, so pressure groups start to target them as well. It's perhaps easier to identify ineffectiveness and the reasons for it than effectiveness. Um, and as I've said, we don't expect you to solve all these issues, but uh, you need to have a good awareness of them. Now, Wing Grant has written a lot on pressure groups. Um, as I've said, particularly pressure groups in British politics. Chapter 10 is particularly important of that book. The, the, uh, the chapter that I wrote with Wynne as well a few years back that looks at you know, why we need to perhaps define um, pressure groups in a different way than maybe we did in the past. That's on the reading list as well. But it is very important that obviously you look at a wide range of literature on this topic, um, including not just conventional journal articles and books, but also the internet and resources such as that as well. Of course, if you are using the internet as a resource, you need to be very, very careful because there's so much information on the internet, it can be difficult to determine what's the credible stuff or the valid and reliable information from not so valid and reliable information. So you need to refer back to what we spoke about earlier in the course and why we need to be particularly cautious on the internet as a resource. So Wing Grant has a, has a typology of effectiveness. In other words, the kind of things that we need to look at in order to work out whether a pressure group is effective. It's important to point out he's not the only person that has come up with a list of reasons such as this. So feel free to look at other examples from the literature. In fact, I would encourage you to do so. And for the very best essays, of course, you need to kind of critique um, things in the literature such as this because they're not necessarily you know, perfect, the world moves on and so on. So for example, one reason, as I keep stressing, is the role of the internet now wasn't so apparent when Wynne was writing um, about 10 or 11 years ago now. So first of all, he looks at the kind of features of the kind of you know, approximate environment of groups, the domains they are seeking to organise. So for example, the characteristics of the potential membership being organised or represented and also competition for, between groups for members and influence. That's the first thing that he, that he suggests. He also says that we need to think about the resources that are available to groups. So we need to think about the internal group structures. We need to think about their marketing skills. You know, are they really good at marketing themselves? We need to think at how good they are actually mobilising members. But as I said at the start, there's a difference between active members and passive members. How much money do they have? What are their staffing resources? What is their sanctioning capability? What kind of strategy are they using? So think about the different kinds of resources that are available to pressure groups and how they feed into effectiveness. In fact, what I would recommend is perhaps you pick out the ones which you think are particularly relevant to your pressure group that you're going to look at and link them to these, to these arguments, okay? So the resources available. Think about the different kinds of resources a group has and how that feeds into how effective they are. And also, features of the external economic and political environment. So this includes things like public opinion, which we've spoken about. It includes things like the political party in office. Is it a left-wing, right-wing government, conservative, Labour government? That will influence how effective a pressure group is. 
The economic circumstances would affect how effective a pressure group is. Also, do they have support or sponsorship from a particular government department? That could affect them, as could delegated authority as well. So the features of the external economic and political environment are also very important. And again, I refer you back to Wing Grant's chapter, chapter 10, where he goes into this in more detail, but stressing all the time, not just to rely on this chapter, to use lots of other examples from the literature as well. Um, in terms of group resources and finance, Badgett um, found a clear relationship between the income of a pressure group and the number of examples of influence reported. He found that you know, income does pay for high quality staff and a small group can win a particular point with a well-researched case, but in general money talks. So in general, the more money a pressure group has, the more effective you might think it's going to be, but nevertheless, even a small group can win a particular point if they've really researched their case. So the relationship between financial resources and effectiveness is something you need to consider in particular. Incidentally, you might very well find that not all the information that you're seeking is on the pressure group of the, on the website of the pressure group that you're studying. And that means you can criticise the website because you can say not all the information is there that should be. And you can do things perhaps such as email the group to find out the information. You know, there should be a kind of contact details on the website. You could email the pressure group in order to find out the information that is missing. So, for example, you could email them to find out about membership, financial resources, and so on. The political party in office is important, as I've said. It can make a difference to how influential or powerful a group is. So, for example, compare how much power the trade unions had in the 1970s under Labour the idea of you know, beer and sandwiches, you know, every five minutes, trade union leaders were going into number 10 to have beer and sandwiches with the, with the Labour Prime Minister, Jim, Jim Callaghan. Compare that to how the trade unions were shut out under the Thatcher government of the 1980s. So which parties in office can influence how effective a pressure group is? Similarly, the poverty lobby was affected by the climate of the 1980s. The argument being that Margaret Thatcher didn't really care about poverty. Therefore, pressure groups such as the Child Action Poverty Group that campaigned on poverty had less influence under her government than they would have had under a more left-wing government. And think about you know, which groups have more influence under the coalition government. Does that complicate things even further? The economic circumstances are going to be really important in determining how a pressure group is effective or not. In difficult economic circumstances, such as the moment, or at times of fiscal restraints, groups demanding increased expenditure may prove unsuccessful. At the moment, the government has a huge debt problem they're trying to resolve. There's not much money to go around. So if you're a pressure group asking for more money, you're not likely to be as successful now as you would be at a time when the government had lots of money. So the overall economic circumstances and fiscal climate, how much money the government has, is going to influence how effective a pressure group is going to be. So consider very much the next few years in Britain in terms of reducing government borrowing, spending cuts, public sector pay and so on. Any group wanting more money or pay rises and so on isn't going to have much luck in the current environment. So economic circumstances are particularly important in determining pressure group effectiveness. Um, I think Kingdon's analysis of, of issues is, I think, something you might like to consider as well. It's a groundbreaking book, Agendas, Alternative and Public Policies, written in 1984. And this looks at how issues come to the attention of policymakers. And um, he identifies three distinct streams, problems, policies and politics. And first of all, he talks about this problem stream. And he says that for a condition... To be a problem, people must become convinced that something should be done to change it. So if public opinion is starting to think um, you know, that things should, should, should change, then that's going to be something that's going to start to mobilise change and take things through. So problem stream is the first thing he considers. Then he talks about this policy stream, this idea of a kind of soup of ideas that may float to the top or fall to the bottom. And the idea that an idea itself has to satisfy a number of criteria to survive and get to the top. So that could be whether it's technically feasible, whether it's compatible with the dominant, dominant values of the community, 
able to anticipate future constraints in which it may operate and so on. So that's the, the policy stream that follows on from the problem stream. And then the political stream, national mood, public opinion, climate of opinion, um, things we've spoken about in the lecture today in terms of public opinion, organised political forces, including pressure groups, government in terms of changes in personnel and jurisdiction, consensus building. And again, you'll see that pressure groups are just one of the reasons affecting policy. Going back to what with this running theme of the lecture, you know, there are many different things that determine policy and policy changes in society. Pressure groups are just one of them. So how are you going to determine cause and effect when there are so many different variables? It can be really difficult to do. And um, he speaks about this idea of a window of opportunity. So at critical times, the political policy and problem streams will come together. It's like a window of opportunity, like the launch window in a space mission. And a smart pressure group will be able to recognise and seize that opportunity. So Kingdon's analysis, I think, is you know, written quite a long time ago, but it's something useful you might like to consider in the context of your project projects on this topic. So, to conclude, what, can we, what kind of conclusions can we come to? Policies do not change just because of pressure group activity. There are many, many different reasons and factors. We need to be very, very aware of the methodological issues, cause and effects, the fact that pressure groups have multiple objectives and, and so on, all the kind of methodological issues that I spoke about in the lecture. Link it to research methods. Think about the kind of research methods that you could use in order to determine effectiveness. You know, participant observation, elite interviews of decision makers and so on. But it's really challenging to use those methods when the decision making process is so secretive. You could, you know, try and carry out, you know, for the best work in your projects, you could undertake an elite interview of your, of your own. You know, even if it's via kind of email or telephone to find out about your pressure group using a research method yourself in this project. Also remember, of course, that when you're studying a pressure group, that is a case study. It's a case study on one particular group. And this links back to what we've spoken about earlier in the course. The idea of the individualistic fallacy. Just because something is true on an individual level does not necessarily mean it's, you can generalise from it. Just because one pressure group acts in a particular way, you can't assume that all pressure groups are going to be the same. Another way of looking at it will be that a pressure group project on one pressure group will lack external validity. It will be difficult to generalise from it. So difficult to generalise from one case study of a pressure group. But despite all these methodological challenges, despite all the difficulties, if we're generally interested in who wins and who loses in the political process and why this is so, then the issue of effectiveness could not be ignored by pressure group analysts. It's a really important topic to consider. So they're the kind of general kind of concluding points that I would make.